We really appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk about an issue that is very important to, um, quite honestly, the entire world, but certainly um, people who are part of SOCAP. We have um, seen the nation struggle with what is, quite honestly, a, a triple crisis, not just the incredible pandemic and the health consequences pandemic, but we are also confronting a economic crisis that many of us would have never expected to see. We just got on the other side of the financial crisis, which challenged the great risk of the great depression. And now we are confronting social justice issues um, that we thought we were on the other side of, um, you know, the combination is put us in a very precarious position as, 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 a, as a globe and certainly here in the United States. And with this in mind, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with Margaret Anadu and Aaron Mitchell, two of my favorite good troublemakers. Uh, and I want to thank you both for joining this conversation. Thank you, Bill. Um, Thanks so for let's, having us. Let's just jump in the, into this. Um, you know, with that background of the triple crisis in mind, we're here to talk about decisions made by Goldman Sachs and Netflix, two very different type of companies. Uh, to focus on creating economic opportunity in communities of color. And Margaret, I'd like to start with you. Uh, you know, we've worked together for several years and we've seen a lot of co companies, a lot of corporations engaged in different types of social impact work. Why did Goldman Sachs, one of the world's largest investment banks, why did you decide to focus on small business several years ago with the 10,000 small business program. And how did you arrive at the decision to, to work with CDFIs to deliver capital into underserved, to underserved entrepreneurs? Sure, absolutely. Um, and Bill, thank you so much for, for inviting me to this conversation and, and Aaron, really looking forward to, to getting to, to go back and forth with you. So. So, so, Bill, you mentioned that a lot of our work over the last six and seven months really came out of a foundation of efforts that we started over a decade ago with our firm-wide initiative, 10,000 Small Businesses. So this is an initiative that provides small businesses with education, access to capital, and business support services. And the thesis behind it was, was actually pretty simple, especially coming out of the crisis. We wanted to do something that would move forward our economy as a whole and be a real important part of the economic progress that we all wanted to see coming out of the downturn. And I'm, I'm glad that it's such a focus today, but 10 years ago, we were thinking about the fact that small businesses employ half of our private workforce, right? So there's a lot in our economy where we focus on the big entities, quite frankly, like a Netflix or, or a Goldman Sachs, but in the communities that we're focused on, it is the, um, the local daycare, the restaurants, the, you know, the graphic designer, all of these businesses that are um, important institutions in communities because of the services they provide, the amenities they provide, but also the employment that they provide. And so the thought behind the initiative was how can we, um, as Goldman Sachs, provide you know, access to capital, um, our intellect, really roll up our sleeves and see what we could do to really advance the growth um, of small businesses all around the country. And so we're incredibly proud of those efforts. We've been able to, to touch to almost 10,000 businesses with our education. And now, you know, especially with partnerships like the one that we have with you, Bill, um, you know, over 16, 17,000 small businesses with our capital. Um, and so as we thought about who we wanted to be our capital partners in this initiative, right? So the education, we work with community colleges all around the country. Um, and we, we chose very purposefully to work with community development financial institutions, of course, Bill, like the one uh, you run, Hope, uh, to deploy that capital for a few reasons. We wanted to make sure in the same way that we were focused with our education, but also with our access to capital that we were reaching businesses that, are, that traditionally have been underserved. Um, and in working with CDFIs who have the expertise, the proven mission, 
um, the local know-how and really being on the ground to work with businesses and really roll up their sleeves, not just to make them a loan, but really be a part of every step along the way. What is the kind of loan that you need? What's important for the growth trajectory of your business? Um, helping put together a business plan. All of those things that are just as important as the cash itself. And so we wanted to work with entities like yours that really have that as part of their mission and, and DNA to really reach the businesses, whether it's in rural areas who are you know, traditionally underbanked, um, low income communities, uh, small businesses that are run by people of color. We've seen the disproportionate impact to those types of businesses in this environment. And so, you know, for the last uh, 10, 12 years, we've been working with institutions like yours who are, you know, the, the folks who know how to get it done for those types of businesses. And those are the businesses we wanted to reach. And so we know we needed to work with institutions that, that do it best. Well, Margaret, and I'm gonna get to Aaron, but just, you know, me, I'm a little, um, I, I wanna know the why and, and the Mississippi Delta, the Black Belt, the rural communities, entrepreneurs, small mom and pop businesses, that's not who you think about when you think about Goldman Sachs. Why, why, why is this important to Goldman Sachs? You know, it's incredibly, it, it's, it's incredibly important to Goldman Sachs. Like we, you know, we talked about this in our, in our investor day back in, in January. We see our core mission and purpose as a firm to advance economic progress for all. Right, and that can't just be on you know you know Midtown Manhattan, right? That has to be in the areas like you mentioned in the in the rural South. And we know that there's great opportunity, there's great values, there's great business ideas, there are great communities, and unfortunately, they just don't always get the capital that they need. And I know that we're we're focusing in the session on on small business because that's been such a significant focus, especially through the last several months in COVID. But we work with community development financial institutions across a variety of our work. We work with CDFIs, actually, you know, Bill, we've done housing work together. Um, we've done healthcare facility work with CDFIs. We have done, you know, a ton of financing of educational facilities. And so it comes from the basic thesis that we do not look at the status quo of a business, of a community, of an entrepreneur, and assume that where they are is, is where they should be or where they can be. We know that there are gaps in access to capital for, for women, for people of color, for smaller institutions, for certain geographies in the country. You mentioned the rural South. And so we, what we wanna do is when we see those gaps where there's a mismatch between what the opportunity should be and where the capital is flowing, we wanna step in and fill those gaps. And so, you know, it's interesting that, that you would say that, you know, you wouldn't always associate that with, with Goldman Sachs, but even in our work around housing and schools and education facilities, uh, you know, the business I run, the Urban Investment Group, this dates back over, you know, almost 20 years at this point. And so it's something we've been doing for a long time. And as you mentioned, working with partners like yourself for a long time, I think it's just come into sharper focus um, over the last several months, just given, you know, as you mentioned, the, the very, you know, severe crisis that we're all in. All right. Well, thank you. I want to dig into the, the to what's, been going on the past few months shortly, but uh, Aaron, um, $100 million, when you called me, um, I hope, was hoping you were going to invite me to be the next star in a Netflix movie, but that wasn't the case. Um, you know, $100 million, that's, that's, that's significant. You talked about it as a meaningful first step. Uh, obviously, this is not Netflix's core business. Talk about your decision to move into this space and, and make that meaningful first step. Well, first of all, thank you, Bill, for, for the invite. Thank you for including me in this discussion alongside Margaret. The work that you're doing at Goldman is amazing, and I'm, I'm just happy to be a part of the conversation. Um, and Bill, I apologize for getting your hopes up on the Netflix thing. I, there's still time. There's still time. It's just, I'm just not the right person. Um, so, the hundred million dollars, you know, when I first reached out to you, Bill, it was, it was, it was still a seed of an idea, right? Like how do we use our banking relationships, our capital to directly impact economic development in these communities? And I think right at the time that I first contacted you, I just, I had just started reading Marissa Baradaran's book, The Color of Money, to really understand the role that black banks and black CDFIs and, and institutions that focused on these communities of color their role 
in economic development. You know, so going back, I, I would love to say that this has been a sort of work in progress over the last 10 years and we've been sort of deliberately at this, but this idea didn't really come to fruition for us until between the months of April and June of this year. And so the reason we got there and, and how we got there is, you know, we started really examining systemic inequality and we started examining where our practices intersect with that systemic inequality. And one of the big ones was on our banking relationships, right? You know, we, we bank with major money market banks for all the obvious reasons. They, they, they allow us to be a global player. Um, they allow us to generate operating accounts, which are required for a company that's doing up to a thousand productions across the world at any given time. So we just need that horsepower and that sophistication. And so a lot of these banks just weren't on the radar for us. When we started asking the question and when we started understanding the problem, it became it became a bit of a no brainer. We can do some real meaningful good by just expanding our business relationships. And so it's, it's, it's an extension of supplier diversity of sorts, right, where where you spend your money in those communities, you can directly impact their growth. And banks play this, as both of you all know, so I'm preaching to the choir, banks have the ability to create a multiplier effect that simply sort of investing in a particular business wouldn't generate. And so as we started to look at the problem and we started to figure out, you know, how do we how do we participate? Unfortunately, we ran into some issues where because of how these banks are capitalized, they could not receive the funding directly. They, they couldn't receive our deposits. So our call to you, Bill, was really like, how do we how do we solve this problem when our solution is not the solution? And you know, through the conversation with you, through the conversation we had with folks at LISC, we were able to align our very specific restraints or, or constraints around our investment policy, such as the duration of our capital being a company that is still uh, negative free cash flow. Um, we needed something that was shorter in duration. We needed something that could be used within communities that need them most, but while also working with institutions that under our investment policy, we deemed as safe. Um, and so CDFIs became an extremely attractive uh, option for us because they had a track record for doing work in the communities uh, that are most impacted by these disparities. Uh, they have the relationships, they have the longevity, um, and they have a record for impact. We selected you, Bill, because of that sustained impact. Specifically, when we look at the um, there, there are about 16 states in the U.S. that have 65% of the Black population. A subset of those states make up the bulk of Hope's business. And so it was important for us, if we were going to do this work, to do this work in communities where our, the, the limited amount of capital we could make available would have a disproportionate impact, a disproportionately positive impact. So that's why the hundred million. In fact, you know, just going back to the number, the number, to be honest, was a bit arbitrary. It needed to be large enough to be meaningful, but it also needed to be benchmarked to something. So we landed on the 100 million because it correlated with 2%, which as we thought about it, is it is a significant enough of our cash to really make an impact in these communities, but not a significant enough amount of our cash to, to be operationally um, challenging for us to overcome. And so that's why we landed on the 100 million. It also gave us an opportunity to use our brand as a, a bit of a motivator to the rest of the business world to say, look, if we can do 2%, if everybody did 2%, that's 20 to $40 billion of capital now available in these communities. So it may be a small sum when you think about your own entire cash holdings, but the, the, accumula the, the cumulative amount can actually change the direction of, the, of this economic situation we're in. And it may be a small sum, but it is game changing in places where wealth has been extracted for generations, as, as, as was defined in the color of, of money, and where it's, net, it's been prohibited from people not being able to save and to grow wealth and build wealth. We, we, you know, what we have been talking about a lot is the incredible wealth gaps between black communities and white communities 
black entrepreneurs, white entrepreneurs, it was 100 to one black families versus with children versus white families with children. That's not going to change without significant, sustained and targeted investment. And I think that is certainly what you have accomplished and have stimulated with Netflix. As you said, there's been a lot of people paying attention to that and um, really appreciate the, the pride that you've given to other corporations around the country. Um, Margaret, as you mentioned, we've been doing this for a while. We worked together initially after Hurricane Katrina, another crisis that we thought was a crisis to end all crisis. And here we are again. Um, when you started looking at the Paycheck Protection uh, uh, Program, Payroll Protection Program, and how do you, as Goldman Sachs, make a difference uh, in helping small businesses get the tools they need to stay afloat? You again focus on CDFIs. Talk a little bit about that decision and, and how it evolved and what Goldman has done um, to help entrepreneurs navigate this crisis. Sure. So yeah, it's it's funny. My 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 heart starts to beat fast when you when you talk about it because as as you know, that was a very you know, intense few weeks and months for all of us, even thinking about how to how to really get our facilities set up. So, so you know, to, to be to be fully transparent, as as the design of the Paycheck Protection Program uh, really started to come to light and more details uh, came together, we were very concerned. Um, we knew, and I think, like you know, like all of us, the the sort of situation that small businesses were in. Um, it was a unique crisis in that we could all see and feel it, right? Everyone could walk down the street and think about their favorite um, restaurant or, you know, businesses that are that are a part of our daily lives and their um, just absolute inability to be to be open because of, you know, forced shutdowns all over the country. And so we started to pay a lot of attention to what stimulus was going to look like coming out of the federal government, and even prior to that we'd actually already started to set up emergency lending facilities. We did one in New York City, we did one in Chicago, even prior to PPP, knowing that these businesses um, were gonna need resources and they were gonna need it very quickly. And you know, I won't, I won't go on for too long about this, but you mentioned that we started to do work together um, right after Hurricane Katrina. And so we had lessons learned from our work that we did post Hurricane Katrina Hurricane um, uh, Superstorm Sandy here in New York, and then some facilities that we actually set up down in Texas after Hurricane Harvey. And the name of the game with those facilities, again, very different disaster that we're dealing with today, but some of, some of the lessons were the same. Small businesses, especially our mom and pop Main Street businesses, they are not sitting on you know, a year worth of cash reserves to get through the kind of revenue drought that we saw and are continuing to see in many of these businesses today. And so we knew they were gonna need capital fast and we knew that that capital was going to need to be deployed with folks who know those businesses, know those communities, know those entrepreneurs and know how to roll up their sleeves. And in many cases work with businesses who through no fault of their own may have never even taken out a loan before. And so as the details started to come together and we knew that there was going to be, and this was right in before the first round and the first allotment of capital, that much capital deployed through a program that if you looked at sort of what goes through the typical kind of 7A and SBA lending channels that were going to be utilized for PPP, it was doing like 70X, the typical volume in a shorter time frame. And we knew that that was, quite frankly, could put, potentially be, be a disaster in terms of businesses' inability to access that capital if you don't have a mainstream banking relationship with the large banks who are going to deploy the majority of that capital. And so we said, we, we got to move quickly. Um, obviously, the large commercial banks, right, they're, they're able to use their own, you know, internal liquidity and resources to lend fairly quickly. But we know that the CDFIs, again, from having worked with them over, over a decade at this point, you know, you, you go out, you get a loan facility, you structure it, you pull it together, and then you, you go and on lend. That was not going to work in this environment. We knew that these CDFIs needed upgraded technology, 
um, you know, very quick uh, liquidity facilities very soon. And so even before the first PPP um, bills were finalized, we reached out directly to the SBA and we said, hey, we're going to want to get a lot of capital to CDFIs. That is what's going to be required to get capital to the smallest of businesses, those in rural areas, those in low income communities, and absolutely those businesses who are owned by Black Americans and other people of color who, even pre crisis, even without the additional stress of this time frame, weren't going to be able to just, you know, walk up to, you know, big commercial bank X and, and get a loan. And so what we did. Pretty quickly, we started with a $250 million commitment, which we then increased to $500 million, which we then increased to $750 million to structure lending facilities. And again, obviously, one, one with you, um, Hope, we uh, worked with Lendistry, uh, another uh, Black-run CDFI out on the West Coast, um, Pursuit here in New York City, a Lyft Fund down in Texas, CDC. Um, CRF, all CDFIs who deeply mission driven, um, significant expertise around serving um, underserved small businesses. And we, you know, put together, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of, of lending facilities to get that to get that capital in the hands of institutions like yours to, of course, get it to the businesses where we needed it to go. The other part that was really important and, you know, Bill, you could obviously tell tell the audience about this in, in even more detail than I can. There's a very big difference in making a, you know, $500,000 loan and making a, you know, $65,000 loan. I think actually, Bill, the average, the average loan size that you were in, your team were able to deploy, I think was sub 50. I think it was something like $40,000. That requires the same amount of work as those larger loans. And so we also wanted to couple our lending capital with the philanthropic capital that was going to be required to hire more people. Right to really bring on additional staff to actually help people get through those applications, understand the process, put together the paperwork, and really have that high touch approach. That is a significant differentiator between a mission driven lender like Hope and you know some of the um, just larger lending institutions. And so we knew that it was about speed. It was about efficient capital. Right, we did all those lending facilities at at zero percent because this, you know, this was this was about kind of urgency in this moment, and then of course that that philanthropy as well. And so we're we're incredibly, um, you know, proud of what we were able to accomplish with 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 our with our lending partners over, um, you know, seventeen thousand small businesses touched with our capital. Um, you know, the median employee count of the businesses that we reached was just two. Right, these are small, small businesses. Um, the average loan size was, you know, less than half the national average, and over a third of that capital was deployed in low-income communities. These same communities that are, many of which are banking deserts. And so, you know, we are still very much aware that more support is needed, uh, more capital is needed. You know, we are still in the, I don't know which inning, but it's certainly not the last one of this crisis. But um, we are very, very, you know, thrilled and proud that by working with Hope and the other um, CDFIs, we were able to reach um, thousands and thousands of these very small businesses um, that that in many cases would be closed otherwise. It's, 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 it's really exciting to think about the journey that we traveled together over these past few months, 17,000 businesses. And I would certainly bet that 90% of those could not have gotten financing through traditional channels, certainly in the first round. And we saw so many who would turn back when they knocked on doors of traditional banks, large banks, small banks, traditional lenders. It just was not built to serve entrepreneurs of color, many of them very small, as you said, um, in the retail and service sector. Which hit hard by the shutdown um, and, and it had a devastating effect on communities of color. The, um, you know, we had so many mom and pop businesses from little barbers and, and daycare centers to service, nonprofit service providers led by people of color that provide critical support services um, that, but for the lifeline that was made available through, through CDFIs would not have I would not be alive. We we see. I think the data 
uh, earlier a few months ago was that 40 percent of all black businesses shut down and may not reopen. So this is a crisis of epic proportions and really appreciate um, you, both of you stepping up and helping to open these doors. Um, Aaron, you know, you again talked about how uh, this was important to Netflix. Um, what look playing it forward in a year and a, in a few years down the road, what type of progress would Netflix like to see as a result of the effort? You talked about others who have been inspired, but talk, talk a bit about what your um, optimist, what, what would you like to see on yep. the other side of this? So without being too lofty and grandiose, um, I think the reason that we were able to get excitement around this initiative, one, we would be able to sustain this into perpetuity unless we had a, a real honest change of heart about its importance. And as far as I can tell, that is not in the cards, right? Like we can commit to doing and sustaining a percentage of our cash moving toward communities of color as a starting point, And we'll continue to examine where our capital can directly impact other communities of need, um, where there have been extractive practices in the past that we can sort of play a role in, in restoring. When I think about two years, three years, five years, 10 years forward, I think about it in terms of not only looking at the racial wealth gap, and starting to see the racial wealth gap close because the capital that we've made available and the capital that a number of organizations have made available are actually becoming loans to small businesses and homes in communities that did not have the capital. You talk a lot about importing capital into communities where the capital base in the entire community is less than $2 million, right? And I think about the importing capital into those communities in the effort to create jobs, because there's talent everywhere, right? Creating jobs, creating housing, creating safety, that then creates prosperity, right? And I and 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 the desire is that this also opens up newer opportunities because the truth is small businesses make up a majority of businesses within America. 98% of those businesses that are owned by black people specifically are sole proprietorships. We would love to start to see that number shift downward so that more of these sole proprietorships are starting to employ people. The more people they employ, the more opportunity for larger amounts of the community. But again, there has to be sustained capital available for those businesses to draw capital on for expansion, right? Because businesses don't grow by themselves. So that's one, one piece of it. Another piece of it would be seeing more entrepreneurial capital available. For us, that's not a risk that we can take with our investment policy now, but over time, we're, we'd like to explore ways to make that capital available for entrepreneurs because that's where these big pops in the economy take place. The number of, of potential unicorns that exist within these communities of color is untapped and unknown because these are services that haven't been provided and these are entrepreneurs who haven't previously been funded. So there's, there's an opportunity there. But we also know that the communities need more than just loans and housing. They also need medical services. They also need education. These are things that our funds aren't necessarily directly providing, but by providing capital into these communities, you create the opportunity for others to come in and solve these problems. One of the reasons that we worked with LISC, in addition to HOPE, in addition to a number of other partners that we'll be onboarding uh, in the next month or so, we, just, we selected LISP because they actually provide means for these wraparound services. They don't just do housing loans. They don't just do personal home loans or auto loans. They also do uh, infrastructure investing. They do healthcare investing. So they provide these wraparound services so that communities can actually prosper because it's a multi-pronged effort that needs to take place. Personally, Netflix is in the business of making content. We're going to focus our effort and our energy and our investment dollars into producing more inclusive stories that tell 
the stories of people around this country and around the world. And as we do that work and we continue to generate capital, we can put more of that into these communities for this sort of virtual cycle to take place. But again, I'm, I'm impatient. So as much of that capital that we can unlock today ensures that that capital will be available a year, two, five, 10 years from now. Uh, that's, that's, that's encouraging. I think you, you talk about the wraparound services, the comprehensive needs of communities. That's really important. And I think it speaks to um, the fact that you made a, I think, a good decision to focus on CDFIs. I often refer to CDFIs as Swiss Army knives. You know, capital is a tool that we use, but we exist to make sure that race, gender, where someone's born, does not limit the economic ladder. But whether it's education or healthcare or housing or a grocery store in a food desert, uh, at some point, all of those economic ladders require capital, financial resources, which is disproportionately absent in communities of color. And so, uh, and that's what CDFIs do. They bring capital into these communities. But as we said that, you know, in a place like Itabina, um, Mississippi or uh, Selma, Alabama, the total deposit potential is just one or $2 million. Um, the 10 million deposit from Netflix you know, that equates to several thousand jobs, several businesses, homeowners, and that those local well-star communities just cannot capitalize themselves. Um, the wealth has been extracted. So this is a form of repairing the wealth <laughs> disparities, you know, mm -hmm. call it reparations, call it whatever you will, is, is bringing capital back into these communities, many of them that are you know, they're Netflix of crabbers, you know, particularly in the last few months while we're sitting at home. Um, you know, they're investments that support Goldman's, um, you know, um, businesses, but often those funds don't go back into these communities. So thank to, thanks to both of you for reinvesting in these places that have been so well starved, um, which takes me to your peer corporations is, um, Margaret, you made mention of uh, of, of, of why it's important to Goldman and the Business Roundtable um, last year talked about the purpose of a corporation being an economy to support economy that works for all Americans and has recently come out with an agenda for racial equity, uh, which is exciting. Um, I'd like to hear both of you speak about what why is it important and what might other corporation investors uh, be doing more of to invest in social change. Um, Margaret? Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll start in, but I'll, I'll piggyback a little bit on something Aaron said that I, that I actually thought was, was kind of deserves to be underscored. I think that, I think that the work that we're doing around CDFIs and sort of, you know, very specific initiatives related to, to COVID and this moment that we're in, I think that's all really important. But I also think it's really important for corporations to be thinking about racial equity and just all just over around like overarching income inequality from the perspective of the core activity of the corporation. Right. So so Aaron and I obviously I, I love the hundred million dollars. I love the ten million dollar deposit with hope. But I also love that Netflix is is focused on black content and black producers and, you know, black artists and black filmmakers, right? And, and people of color, like, because that is Netflix's core business. Goldman Sachs, if you think about our core business and what we've been doing for, you know, 150 years at this point, fairly successfully, is we work with individuals, corporations, governments, all sorts of institutions, and we help them. We give them advice around capital. We provide that capital directly. We provide access to the capital markets and we know like painfully that that system is not working appropriately for many demographics, certainly black Americans, certainly women, 
certainly, um, you know, different groups geographically. And so while providing capital to, to CDFIs and the work that we're doing in these communities, you know, might seem like an initiative or something that's off to the side, like providing access to capital is our core business. And if we are not doing it in a way that is thorough and that is inclusive and that is thinking um, about all sectors of our economy, then we're failing. Um, and so to your question about what other corporations, and, and I know we're, we've obviously talked about CDFIs, but there's the work that we're doing around asset managers or the work that we're doing about sort of, you know, people of color and, and venture and, you know, founders of color and the capital that they get. Uh, there's, of course, all the work we're doing around place in the built environment. And so, you know, I, I don't view this as something uh, that is charitable or something we feel like we need to do. It is our core business. Um, and so as I, as I think about, you know, other corporations, I think it's important to recognize how all these large institutions um, have, have benefit from the, you know, broader economy and society and do what they can to give back. But I think what's even more important, again, is the core activity. So if you are a, you know, food company, right? What, what's your role in this? Is, is the food healthy? Is the food fresh? How are you, how are you marketing to certain demographics? If you are a large, um, you know, consumer products company with a very significant retail footprint and you disproportionately employ people of color, what does that look like? What do the wages look like? What do the benefits look like? And so I think, I think it's, it's, it's great to do work that looks like it's on the side or it's charitable or it's philanthropic, but I think the number one place to start has to be with the core activity of the corporation. And so one of the things, and I was, I was very, you know, proud and excited as, as obviously, an, you know, an employee of Goldman and, and a senior leader within the firm was, you know, what we said about our, our, our own institution, right? There's how you, there's the business you do, there's how you operate, and then the, the things that you have to do to fill in, philanthropy, policy, et cetera, where, and this is, you know, predates COVID and, and predates, um, you know, the, the tragic events that we all sort of, you know, witnessed in the, witnessed earlier this year, but thinking about the diversity of our, of our own institution. And it was a big moment for two things that, that our CEO did. One, right, we are, we're a premier investment bank. We are top of the league tables always. And it was important for David Solomon to stand up and say, we're not going to take companies public anymore if there's not at least one diverse board member, right? That's our core business, right? We advise companies, we take them public. And so to think about, you know, diversity in that context was really important. And then our own firm and our own employees, right? Setting, uh, you know, we set and met targets around, you know, the diversity that we want with our incoming um, classes off of, you know, out of business school, out of college, but then also took that a very significant step forward and said, you know, our vice president population, which is the most significant in terms of numbers at the firm, what we wanted that diversity to look like and putting numbers out there and goals out there and holding ourselves accountable, you know, doubling the, the number of students that we're going to hire from HBCU. So I think it's, it's a long winded answer, but it's a full prong approach. It's, it's philanthropy is important. Core business is important. You know, representation matters within the old firm. And I think, I think we have to do it all. I think none of none of these things independently are enough. Yeah, and, and I love everything you said, Margaret. My my riff on that is, you know, kind of going back to your comment about what's core to the company, right? Like to put it real simple, what is good for what is good for all companies is for our economy to be healthy, strong, and growing as healthily and strong as it can be. McKinsey produced a report in August of 2019 that said that closing the racial wealth gap will generate an additional one to $1.5 trillion by 2028, an additional four to six percentage points of GDP. There's no country on the planet that would be like, hmm, I pass on GDP growth, right? So literally, if we do this, and we do this holistically and systemically, we can generate economic growth which we absolutely 100% would not pass on, and that's good for all. So by helping the most vulnerable communities in this country, which are 
among them Black communities, Native American communities, Hispanic communities, um, and helping those individuals who have been discounted from the economy, whether they be women or LGBTQ or any number of the, the folks that I've mentioned, we can generate an additional one to $1.5 trillion. That seems like a no-brainer to me. In a, in a country that is becoming rapidly majority black and brown, it's in everyone's self-interest to make sure those people are equipped to be productive, prosperous contributors to the economy. So that's exciting. Um, I like to uh, welcome uh, Keisha Center of SOCAP, who's going to help us take and see a lot of questions coming from the audience. And I think you all are uh, willing to help us navigate, uh, respond to some of those questions. So Keisha, tell us. Tell us what folks Thank know. you. This has been such a lively conversation. I've been jotting down all of the questions that I can, but there are so many. So um, continue to put them in there and just thank you, Aaron, Bill, and Margaret for that dynamic conversation. And yes, Aaron, I was about to say, someone asked, could you put the link in the um, for the study? So that was the first one. So um, I'm sure you all have seen them, seen some of the questions, and quite frankly, through the dynamic conversation, you got to a lot of them, but I'm going to just touch on one that I thought was really interesting. Um, Margaret, to you, they said that Goldman, has Goldman Sachs seen other banks follow their lead in committing meaningful um, capital to CDFIs? And are you all looking to push other institutions and your peers in that direction? Yeah, you know, I think that um, there, there have been so many announcements over the last few months. And, and I know that, and I think, you know, and Bill specifically, I know has a relationship with, with Bank of America, just as one example. I, I, I have seen other, other banks make commitments to CDFIs. I know that Bank of America does. I know that Chase does. Um, I'm pretty sure that Wells does as well. So we, we have seen, we have seen announcements coming out and, you know, continuing to flow from from other financial institutions who've either worked with CDFIs before previously, or certainly it's a it's a big part of, of what they're gonna be doing going forward. So I, I do think the financial community more broadly is really wrapping themselves around CDFIs. And one one note I'll plug, and I know and I know I said a little bit about it earlier. I'm so excited about kind of like this moment that CDFIs are having. And there was that great New York Times piece, and people are really recognizing all the good work that they do. And, Bill, I hope you'll beat this drum with me as well, right? It's it's not just small business, right? We work with CDFIs on healthcare facilities, grocery stores, um, not-for-profit schools, housing. We've actually done industrial deals, you know, creating real, you know, middle-income jobs in black and brown communities. So CDFIs are, are definitely the heroes of the moment as it relates to these underserved small businesses, but they do so much more, so much more. No, I, I'll just add that, you know, I really appreciate what you said about making the corporations looking at their core businesses and thinking about how they can use right. those assets to make a difference. It's really important because while it's an important rounding error, it is a rounding error. Um, what, what your investments in CDFIs is, is transformative to the CDFI sector. But in the scheme of the economy, we know that we are the really the R and D arm until we're more adequately capitalized. So you know, the, you, you both are at the top of the food chain in your respective industries. You can really make a difference if companies use their assets. So to can you hear me now? Yes, Keisha. Mm -hmm. Did we lose Keisha? I think we did. Oh, we did. I could actually, I could Absolutely. play a Q&A moderator. I see a lot of them. Let's see. Um, touch on. Yeah, we did cover a lot of this. I'm, I invited someone in. Um, got a couple of people who mm -hmm. said they wanted to make questions. I invited them to join. I think Penelope Douglas. Oh, this is an interesting one, Bill. What about this? So this is from Courtney Riley. 
It says, could more be done to educate entrepreneurs and future entrepreneurs before how to speak the language, know their resources, learn to plan sustainable businesses, social impact business? What does it look like to inform black and brown folks about the industry so they're not catching up when disaster hits? I want I want to make one point about this because I you know obviously every small business could use you know some technical assistance some help but I, I just want to like correct a little bit of the record around sort of what happened with PPP and what was needed to get capital to these businesses and especially on the on the topic of, of black owned businesses black entrepreneurs in this country are some of the most dynamic resilient talented like crushing it entrepreneurs you have ever met, right? So these are businesses that have survived and you know served their communities and employed people, even despite all of the systemic issues around access to capital, relationships with the banking sector, et cetera. And so what you saw happening in, in PPP was not, you know, like, like, it, it, like it was lost on these business owners that mainstream banking relationships would be helpful. In many of these cases, they tried, right, and been rejected for a whole, you know, host of issues that would be a much longer panel than this. And then two, and I think this was not well covered in, in the media, you had many businesses, you know, for example, take actually this is one in Harlem that I'm really close to. Great guy, you know, is a florist, started his business probably, you know, six or seven years ago, very successful did that with his own sweat, never got capital, and so had just never taken out a loan. And so if you've never been through that process of getting a loan and have succeeded and even, um, you know, really uh, excelled despite that, you know, it's not like you did something wrong along the way that you just don't necessarily have been through that lending process. And so I think it's, I think it's important to note just how incredible these businesses are and you know, and having such success despite a financial system that doesn't that doesn't always. Uh, I just, Mark, just to add to that, yeah, just to, just to add, I, I think you know, building on that, and, and John Rogers talks about this sort of concept of business diversity, sort of as an extension of supplier diversity, right? So instead of just focusing on people who make stuff, focusing on individuals who provide services, whether it be consulting or banking, etc., but one of the acknowledgements is the lack of exposure, right? Like a lot of these entrepreneurs of color don't have access to even know what they don't know, right? And so the education in some instances is not like this monumental lift. It's not like, oh, we have to show them how to open their books. Oh, we have to, it's, you, they just needed to know what number to call and they didn't have that directory. So in a lot of cases, exposure and in creating those access points is like 60 to 70% of the work. It's not, it's not like uh, there's such a lack of sophistication because like you said, these are individuals who've hustled, who resilience is just in the DNA because without it, you don't, you don't have a business to open the next day. So how do we as corporations create the, the access points? How do we create the connectivity where this capital exists, where this experience exists, where this expertise exists, and, and bring these communities together. And I think that's that's part of what needs to be part of the, the ongoing discussion. Yeah. I just yeah. want to just jump one point. I think the point both of you made is so important because there's a really false narrative about the lack of capacity in communities of color and entrepreneurs of color. And it's sometimes uh, is attributed to CDFIs led by people of color. It's but if you've got family, um, a, 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 a parent who will make you a loan to start a business, or a cousin who's an accountant that can help you navigate financial challenges, or a neighbor who's an attorney, then you have a network that can that, that a lot is built in for a lot of non-black and brown entrepreneurs. It is just not available to people who've been so systemically discriminated against and disenfranchised. And so just what these organizations and these businesses and entrepreneurs have been able to do with two hands tied behind their back is incredible. So I, I really think those points are critically important. And Bill, one great question that we got 
that came in for you was what strategy do you recommend for leveraging future investments in the in the south which is often un underrepresented in spaces like this and the opportunities for investors in doing so and it's somewhat of a two part because they also asked margaret you know one million dollars can go really far specifically in south carolina with a place with only five million residents how can we get more co corporations to support cdfis um, in the south so it's kind of the same question but for each one of you uh, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly say i've always found that the data and every now and then yes people do pay attention to data and science but the data as you see this increasingly brown and black uh, country, um, if we don't invest in um, this segment of the population, what's our future workforce going to be? Who are who are the people who's going to buy products and services and uh, from the companies? And so I think connecting those dots has been critically important. I find that when uh, I've had a lot more success engaging the business community. Um, you know, even though they're not disconnected um, from politics, they they have shareholders. They have to take a loan review, and they know how important markets are to their success. And so, I think that's a really important opportunity to close the gap, particularly in the deep south, which is you know, quite honestly becoming more diverse, uh, diverse quicker than other parts of the country. Margaret, did you have anything to add? Um, one of the spe specifically, they were just wondering how do we get large companies to um, Azure's to start looking at, you know, geographically the South even more. And that might be some work that you're already doing. Oh, we. You muted, Margaret. Yeah, we can't hear you. Margaret. Can't hear you. I think I was on mute. Gosh, you guys missed it. What I said was so eloquent. Let's see if I can try it again. I'm just kidding. Um, I, I was going to say, I didn't, I, you know, uh, steal any thunder from some of the things that, you know, that, that, that Bill and I expect to announce pretty soon, but we are, we're nowhere near done with in the South. We deployed probably a good third of the capital um, that we did in PPP in the South and some of these same communities that have that have struggled the most to get capital and, and we think there's a lot more to do. I think to the question around kind of corporations and how you, you know, encourage them to, to do more, you know, I think the, the world is evolving, not fast enough, but, but it is. And this is not just important to our shareholders. It's important to our employees. It's important to our clients. It's important to our partners, right? This real concept of kind of stakeholder capitalism, like, I don't think that, maybe it sounds a little ominous, I don't think that corporations as we move forward, if they want to attract the type of investment that they need, public and private markets, attract the kind of talent they want in their employee base, have the kind of clients that they want, can continue to sort of, you know, only focus on, you know, their, their, their products and services, right? Every company's kind of role in society and, and what they're doing in their communities more broadly, I think it's only getting more important. And so I, I, I think that you will see more and more corporations doing really thoughtful and intentional work around inclusive growth, not just within their core business, but also um, in all of the extra work that they do outside of it. Okay. Um, sorry, go ahead, Bill. I think you're muted. Now, I know we're coming up toward the bottom of the hour, and I do want to ask Aaron and Margaret just to touch briefly. We've got a room full of, of, of we've got the choir here, quite honestly. And so what would you suggest that folks on this call can do to help move the ball further toward the goal line? Um, what, what to probably build on some of the examples, what would you suggest other investors, potential investors, um, my action that they might take. I'll say this from the, from the, from the corporate side um, and my wonderful partner in crime and treasurer Shannon Alwyn will probably hate me for saying this, but, you know, we've gone through a lot of trouble to try to make it really easy for others to replicate our model. 
So one thing that we've done is we've documented just about everything so that the challenges that we uh, experience going through this process, folks won't have to sort of hit those same walls. And some of those challenges for us were just things like our investment policy, our sort our, our, the accounting challenges, timing, et cetera. So we've worked through all that. We have a blueprint and we're happy to share it. So I'd say connect with our treasurer if you're like working through some challenges, because we, we were able to go from zero to announcement in 10 weeks. And so we, we were able to figure it out fairly quickly. Like I said, I'd love to say that I've been working on this for the last 10 years, like Margaret has said, but you know, we woke up in 2020, like this is terrible. What can we do? And we were able to make that happen. So connect with our treasurer as one point Two, connect in with the folks at LISC, right? Because the reason that we settled on LISC in addition to working directly with folks like Bill and other CDFIs, we can't, we can't provide all of the needs that the CDFIs have. For instance, we can't provide equity in the cases where equity is required, but LISC can. LISC is raising a $250 million fund. This is not an advertisement for LISC, but LISC as a, as a potential solution, because honestly, we almost hit the wall on, on moving forward with this initiative until we worked with LISC on creating something that frankly didn't exist before. And so I know that there are, in addition to LISC, a number of investment firms that are, that are creating products to help solve these problems. And there's a lot of ingenuity and creativity in this space. So feel free to reach out to me, feel free to reach out to Shannon Alwyn, our treasurer, um, and feel free to reach out to the folks at LISC, specifically George Ashton and Maurice Jones. You can tell them Aaron Mitchell sent you. Like we really wanna change stuff. So like there's no, there's no introductions or you know preamble required, just make it happen. Margaret? Yeah, I, I think we only, I guess we only have one, one minute left. I guess maybe, maybe change in a little bit. So I think, I think Aaron covered well, sort of from a, from a, from a corporation perspective in terms of capital and CDFI specifically, I guess, I guess what I would say is that there's, there, there, there are initiatives and there are moments in time. And then there's sort of like the work and decisions that we're all making each and every day. And I think if we're going back to just sort of the core issue, the racial wealth gap, right? That's around, uh, you know, Bill mentioned, it's about where you grow up and your community and education and access to entrepreneurship capital and healthcare. Like there's so many, there's so many places and ways that the racial wealth gap has um, compounded and become quite sticky. And so I think that all of us in who we hire, the businesses that, and I mean, this is individuals, the hiring decisions we make, the businesses we choose to support, the everyday like actions, that, where, we, where we buy clothes, where we buy food. I, I think there's an opportunity for even individual citizens in their everyday lives to make decisions that are, that are more inclusive and, um, and that make a dent in, in racial equity. And so I think it's in the, the first thing you gotta do is just to think about it and be thoughtful about it all the time, right? I don't, I don't have a choice, I'm a black woman. I think about race every single day. Um, and I think that more that people have it in mind and are thoughtful about it, I think that you can make decisions every single day that move the needle. Margaret. And vote. And uh, vote, sure. absolutely. Margaret, Aaron, thank you. You've made two of the major companies on the planet better. Um, it's just shows what two people can do. So thank you for all that you do to address these issues. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us and invite you to join my colleagues in our virtual booth right after this session. Go to the expo and also we'll be there Wednesday and um, Thursday, I guess, at noon. So. We can continue the conversation, but um, thank you, vote, and keep making a difference. Have a blessed day. Thank you, Bill. Thank you all. And... Thank you. Good. All right. Thank you, Aaron. All right. See you later, Bill. All right. Take care, my friend.